Perfect yeah. time. What's well, perfect timing? How you doing? I got no complaints. Just gratitude. Gratitude. Because, you know, although sometimes life deals you adversity and obstacles and such, you improvise, you innovate, you find a way through, you find a way around, you find a way. And the show goes on. And so, uh, as I, I said there earlier, um, during your um, transit, you know, uh, uh, there at the beginning of October there in La Primera Semana de la Mesa, right? In the first uh, week of the month of October, while you're doing all that stuff with, you know, uh, you know, taking the bus to meet the coyote and then the coyote <laughs> gets you across the border. Well, and then that wasn't you exactly go how I was going to do it. Then you go to the different. That's expensive, spots where man. They've left. Um, That's like five water. grand. Are you kidding me? Oh, you're just gonna drive? No, I'm gonna take a plane, dude. I'm oh. like, I'm like a 15 minute walk from the international airport. Like wow. literally, I go out of the uh, the I don't know compound, whatever the hell it is. There's only one way in, one way out, right? And it leads to the main road. I go out to the main road, I hang a right, I walk for like 15 minutes, and I'm at the airport. Wow, that, that's ironic, because let's just say, perhaps, that you were going to fly into Washington Dulles. Oh, fuck no. Airport. Let's, <laughs> no. Just, let's just suppose that was the case. Okay, uh, imagine, right. if you will, you're going to fly from Acapulco, Mexico, to um, Loudoun County, Virginia. I know, just just stretch the mind there. It, rest in, rest in, Virginia. Oh, God. Anyways, talk Sterling. about a spooky place. It's actually Sterling. Be, yeah. Sterling yeah. and Reston are both very spooky places due to all the spooks that mm -hmm. are living there. Um, so you could literally walk to the um, Aeropuerto Internacional de Ocopoco Más o menos en 15 minutos, right? More or less than 15 minutes. Yeah. Depending on traffic. Yeah. If you fly into Dulles, as in the Dulles tools in the deep state toolbox, ha ha ha, fuck you, Alan, and your shitty little brother. Um, so you've flown directly to Dulles. You get out, you go down to the fucking carousel, you wait for your luggage to come around the thing, you get your luggage, you're like, you, you know, you turn to your buddy, you're like, so do, do we get a lift or an Uber? You know, we got to go to Crystal City and everything. Oh, oh no, bro. We can just take the Silver Line. Hmm. We'll take the Metro. It's like, oh, okay. Believe it or not, 25 fucking minute walk from the baggage claim to getting on the Silver Line station um, because... Well, you see, there used to be this administration called the Bi uh, Obama Biden administration when they were completing the Silver Line. And as it turns out, when they initially built the passenger terminal at Dulles International Airport, they actually built a second lower level basement with a subway station in the fucking terminal building. Hmm. That. After building a tunnel on the Silver Line underneath the Tyson Corner shopping mall, when they port and they finally had to track all the way up to the airport property, Obama at the last minute changed the design with the current Secretary of Transportation at the time. I think his name was Ray Liotta, big Hollywood guy. No, no, it's Ray something else. Um Ray shithead, we'll say. Yeah. Anyways, Ray shithead, the pre the predecessor to the current Secretary of Transportation, um, representing Rat Nation, um, South Bend, Indiana Mayor um, Poot Booty Fudge mm -hmm. uh, is now running the Secretary, uh, now running the Department of Transportation. But anyways, uh, they said, "Fuck it, we're gonna move the airport Silver Line station." to the complete 
far fucking end of the long-term parking lot on the other side of the car rental lot and just have you walk for mm-hmm. 20 fucking minutes. Yeah, we're not even going to do like a All tram the way or across the, and, and we'll just leave the subway station that was already built inside the airport terminal unused. And so they waited for almost 50 fucking years for the tracks to be connected to the subway station. And Barack Obama at the last minute moved the station to the complete far end of the fucking airport property. Yeah, I was living out there when that was going on. People were like angry doesn't even begin to describe it. Because you wait for 50 years and then you finally get it out there. And at the last minute, you're going to move the fucking Silver Line Airport stop. Literally to a point that's over a quarter fucking mile from baggage claim. Now I will I will couch this. They had the little underground pedestrian tunnel with the fucking belt that you can stand on for some of it. That's right, they um, do. The people mover thing. <laughs> the people and, mover, you know, yeah. But I gotta say, it's a really slow people mover. It's really they slow. They all are. They're all like sick. literally I could walk alongside somebody that's on the people mover and be rolling a fucking joint or better a blunt. I could roll a blunt and still beat somebody that's standing still on that people mover. But just the shitty people mover that gets you from the Washington Metro to which, you know, which brings up the whole thing. Why would you ride the Washington Metro anyways? I mean, mm-hmm. has it been that long since you smelled human urine and feces? <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, come on. Has it you remember bad? what it smells like? You don't have to pay for that ticket. No, I haven't been on Metro since. <laughs> I think it might have been late 90s was the last time I was on the Metro. <laughs> and it, it was, was all fun. right back then. Yeah, that, it was that's fun. About, that's about three derailments ago. Oh. Uh, Remember that bad one on the green line? Oh, yes. Up there in fucking PG, currently. Um, uh huh. Home of the Maryland Twerps. Shout out PG County. Always <laughs> causing trouble. That's right. <laughs> fucking Prince George County. It's like I got all kinds of friends in Prince George County. Mm-hmm. Oh, so you have black friends? Yep. Well, that too. <laughs> that too. <laughs> Why can't it be both? <laughs> It's called George Washington Parkway. It's the shortcut to BWI. Because, you know, why would you fly to Dulles when you've got National or BWI? Way better mass transit connections, right? At Washington National, it's right there, your subway connection. Same thing with BWI. It's right on the Northeast Corridor. And, of course, I would be remiss not to break it to the audience here on the inaugural episode of Get fact harder <laughs> with Colonel Drizzle and Major High Yona. Um, and so it turns out there's actually three different underground subway systems within our nation's capital, the District of Columbia. Because, you know, when they talk about the, the January 6th um, super duper insurrection and in, 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 um, with all of the MAGA chud um, insurrectioners, insurrectionists, yes, insurrectionists, you know, the ones that were walking between the velvet ropes and taking selfies with the security inside. Oh, but, yeah, yeah. Anyways, uh, but that's just like the main Capitol building itself. Because uh, remember, folks, and this is get fact harder. So take notes if necessary. We're going to run through this real quick. Turns out 50 states. Two senators for every state, pit time. So that's a hundred right there. Hundred senators. Okay. And keep up with me. Okay. All right. And then you got 435 representatives. That's your congressmen, congresswomen, and congress um non-gendered. Um, and so that's 435 plus 100, that's 535. All right. You still with me? Okay. Congress, so you got congress 535 Mixon. legislators. Yeah. And and they all meet in the Capitol, which has two wings, the Senate wing and the c- congressional wing. And then sometimes they have joint sessions of Congress. Mm-hmm. And um, they get real high. And they get really, really high and mighty at those. Because, I mean, literally, uh, 
behind the wall there, if you'll look on the wall, it has the Roman symbol for the fasces. The fasces, you know, where you got the sticks bundled together and then the axe head on top. Lit they literally have Mussolini drip <laughs> inside the main congressional room with that awesome night. I'm going to say like, it feels like Rome 1942 mm. inside the Capitol with all that. I mean, all we need is Il Duce, you know what I'm saying? Shout out Benito Mussolini um, and um, Silvio Berlusconi. Bunga Bunga Party, the uh, current <laughs> president of uh, Italy. Uh, uh, what's that bitch's name? Uh, Maloney. She's uh, a Maloney. Yeah, Ma yeah, Maloney Baloney. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Maloney on the Baloney Pony. Loving the Bunga Bungas there. But so. Yeah, she it looks turns like out, a, she was fun back in the day. I'm just saying. There is technically enough room for offices for all. 535 federal legislators within the Capitol building itself. Technically, you could say so, but that's not been the case for quite some time. It, as it turns out, if you want to see a congressman or congresswoman or senator or maybe, uh, you know, shout out to all my vegans out there, maybe you want to take your purple and green striped quaff up in in front of one of the congresswomen or congressmen or congress non-gendered persons um, offices and protest for the climate change and the orcas and the manatees or whatever you want to do. Well, it's not going to be in the Capitol building itself. It'll be in what's called one of the congressional annex buildings. And as it turns out, there's about, I don't know, eight, 10, 11, there's a shit fuck ton of congressional administrative buildings that all flank the Capitol building itself on Capitol Hill itself, where you can go see your different congressmen and congresswomen or senator. And so the issue becomes the fact of their staff, you see, because like if you're like a senior senator, Right, like die fi with that beaver face and that one eye bulged out and shit, right? You got your diaper changers, you got all your handlers, you got all your staffers, you got all your interns unpaid. Um, you know, all these different people, right? Because I mean the unpaid interns are obviously for the sex. So, anyways, you got this huge staff that you're pounding into your interns with. Um, it's a strap on in Die Fi's case, Diane Feinstein. Shout out California. Um, and so, or if you're like a freshman congressman or freshman congress non-gendered person, right, from uh, California, obviously, <laughs> um, maybe you only have like six or seven staffers, right? But all in all, you do the math and all of a sudden, the congressional entourage when you add in all of the staffers and interns and fluffers and, you know, bootlickers and not even counting the lobbyists, just the official staff with their lanyards. I think it, what, it was about 4,000 some people. So here's the problem. They have votes for different legislation. Because remember, I did mention the lobbyists. Well, it turns out lobbyists actually write all the bills. <laughs> That's how the sausage is made, folks. The lobbyists write the bills. And then they give the bills to the legislators to just pass. And so then red lights will come on in all the different congressional buildings saying, it's time to go vote. And in order to go vote, to get to the floor to vote, well, some of them can't walk fast enough to get there in time or be wheeled there fast enough in time. That's where we get the three subway systems that connect the Capitol building to the congressional annex buildings. Private legislator subway systems with catenaries on top. Like, Think of like maybe like a caterpillar, like golf cart type thing where like four or five golf carts have been attached together 
Like it almost looks like a Disney ride or something, maybe, and an amusement park. And then that's what ferries the senators and the congressmen and congresswomen back and forth uh, from the Capitol to all these uh, congressional office buildings on the periphery. And so, fun fact, fun fact. Uh, yeah, it's not just that they're on the periphery, Yona, because I've got the, the map pulled up right now, and I'm looking at it, and you can see like the whole south side is nothing but house office buildings and then if you go to the north side boom you've got the same thing a whole bunch more office buildings look there's there's the office for senator uh kirsten gillibrand right yep. there right there and then on the back side You've got Supreme Court, Library of Congress, like all of that stuff. So the yeah, entire complex too. is surrounded. Now, ironically, congressmen, congresswomen, and congress non-gendered peoples um, in the House of Representatives, they're kind of treated like the red-headed stepchild on Capitol Hill. They yeah. do have a subway system, but it doesn't have doors or a nice little covering or anything. It's just almost looks like mining carts that they have to ride in. And it's really old. Looks like it's from the 1950s. It's just busted down looking. And because you're a fucking congressman. <laughs> Anyways, okay. Or maybe, maybe you get to ride on that brand new pimp upgraded subway the one that used Ooh. to be the cool ass monorail you know what i'm saying it's got truck nuts hanging off of every fucking car it's got the roof it's got the fucking velvet interiors you know what i'm saying the padded seats senate u.s senate seal on it pimp drip right right and and, and that has a stop that hits the supreme court and and that's what kirsten gillibrand would be taking right you know well yeah but you know a yeah. lot of the American people, I don't think, are aware of the fact that it's only been very recently that senators were even elected. I don't think that most people know that for the better part of the history of the United States, senators were appointed. And, uh -huh. you know, many people would say that that is still true. Right. Yeah, that's how it works. Money talks, bullshit walks. Um, and so I would also venture to say that um, a fraction of the U.S. population would probably be unaware that there was any type of subway system in Washington, D.C. God bless America. Uh, mm -hmm. But for those that are aware, I would say the majority are aware of the Washington Metro. And that subway system with its red line, blue line, yellow line, green line, silver line, orange line. Of course, I, I did that special song just for the drizzle himself. Uh, I don't remember what New that Dominion song was State? called. Uh, the New Dominion State. Yeah, we played New that. New Dominion State. We actually just played that. It was either Friday night or Saturday night yeah. on the pre-show. Yeah, I think I, I think I heard that on the Saturday night freak yeah. out fest um, while I was out working. Um, but anyways, I'm going to venture to say that only a tiny fraction of the U.S. population is aware of the fact that there are actually four different subway systems hmm. that do not connect with one another in D.C. And three of them Although U.S. taxpayers pay for paid for its construction, installation, and continue to pay for its maintenance and for the drivers and porters, because all of these special little Disney ride looking Six Flags Texas fucking subway cars for your senators and congressmen, they're all manually driven by conductors who wear the little Morgan Freeman hat and everything like they're driving Miss Daisy. Um, and then they also, because it's they're, they all have a staff of two. There's the driver, and then there's the porter guy who gets out of the back and then opens the door for them and curtsies when they get out. Because they're public servants. 
Well, that, 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 now, the, the congressmen in their shitty little thing, there's only a driver. And the doors automatically slide open when they get to the stop like an elevator because you're a congressman. <laughs> but, you know, senators, you know what I'm saying? It's like they're opening a fucking carriage, right? And you're stepping out. Oh, it's out. like they're royalty. Yeah. You know, yeah. well, of course, everywhere senators walk, there's already red carpet. Yeah. And there's red carpet in their subway thing. So they're on red carpet the whole time. Um, I think the congressional subway stop has vinyl. <laughs> Because the congressman, <laughs> that would make sense. That would make suck at lobbyist like, dick what? a little bit longer, and maybe you'll make senator one day. One maybe. day, keep that's believing. right. Keep keep, keep reaching believing. for those stars. Just keep believing. What is the significance of the red carpet? Do you know? Um. Hmm. I know the significance of the red wing. And I'm wondering if it's related <laughs> to the red carpet. I'm not and, sure. Because I, I know, like, for those uh, University of Alabama fans down there, shout out Tuscaloosa, um, they're known as the Crimson Tide. And their whole um, war chant during games is Roll Tide. Because, uh, you know, Alabama was known for the Crimson Tide because there for a while they were butchering elephant meat in Mobile Bay. And there was so much elephant meat butchered in Mobile Bay that there was literally elephant blood rolling with the tide up the river uh, in Mobile Bay. And that's that's why the University of Alabama mascot is an elephant and they're known as the Crimson Tide. Roll Tide, and that's the rest of the story, Paul Harvey. I don't know how we got into Southeastern Conference football lore, but uh, uh, anyway, you were you were uh, trying to dodge the question that I asked because you didn't know the answer. That's how we got there. Ah, uh, yeah, that's all right because I don't know the answer to it either. Um, but I, it's, at it's the moment, I'm trying to clean up the spam that has invaded the Liberty radio telegram channel. And I'm not happy oh, about shit. it. I'll tell you that. Oh shit. Yeah. Yeah, man. It, I don't know, uh, what's happening, but, uh, apparently we got on somebody's radar and, uh, they are not happy about what we are doing. Oh, cool. Then you're doing <laughs> it right. I guess. So. You know, uh, I made, Huntington, West Virginia club history. The, uh, let's see, it would have been, it was Tuesday. No, here it is. Saturday, September the 9th is when I played. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, AKA, yeah. uh, the V club. And I played four songs four different languages oh nice in one set and you know i asked the guy that does the sound there he'd been doing the sound there for 35 years at the board and he said that they'd had a bunch of bilingual acts that had sang in either english and spanish or one was in english and french uh, and then they had some acts that didn't know any English and sang in their language, he said. But to his knowledge, in 35 years he's worked there, he never heard anybody get up on stage and in 10 fucking minutes sing four different songs in four different whole ass languages. So leave it to your favorite polyglot DJ Hi Yona to set new records. Nice. Next time I play there, I'm going to do six languages. Fuck it. Fuck Why it. not? I mean, how many no. how many languages can you do at once? I probably could sing in twelve different languages. <coughs> All in one Make song. It a baker's or... dozen. Make it a baker's dozen. I'm going to say. I could do 13 languages. 
of songs, singing songs. Now, in terms of fluency, I'm probably only fluent enough to like carry on a adult college level conversation in only six languages. But in the other seven, you know, I can obviously still like be tourist level English, right? Major phrases, mm -hmm. conjugate verbs. I can get around. I can sing some of the songs in that language, but not like my level of fluency when it comes to Spanish or French or German or Arabic or Cherokee or English, you know, or Italian. Um, speaking of which, um, since uh, you're going to be leaving the land of endless summer for the land of uh, endless electricity. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it is definitely I not to. that. I had to. <laughs> um, I thought, um, while I'm on here, because I'm always doing some live music type stuff. Mm hmm and uh, I think we'll try to do this track called Acho Tio, uh, which for, for those that aren't familiar, uh, down in Latin America, which is basically everything Mexico and South. Um, yeah. uh, uh, in Latin America, they have these fruit markets with a, um, oh, what's a good scrabble word? A plethora, a cornucopia of wild and exotic fruits. <clears throat> um, one of those being achotillo, right? Um, another fruit people may be familiar with would be uh, aguacate or avocados, right? Um, which it's kind of weird because like, just common words for common shit are different in almost every country. Like, and that has to do with the, the creolization of the indigenous languages with Spanish. And that's why slang words and Chilongo, which would be like people from Mexico city, right? Chilongo versus Tamalipano, which would be, you know, uh, Matamoros right next to Texas. Right. Or, um, Sinaloense, which would be, you know, if you're kicking it with El Chapito and Culi and Culiacan, right? Or, uh, um, you know, there's basically about 180 indigenous languages that are still spoken regularly in Mexico's 33 states. Oh, wow. um, and, of course, in Mexico, one of the official languages is uh, Nahuasco or, or Nahuas, with Aztec. Hmm. along with Spanish, because the Aztec word for the colony of La Nueva España, which is what the Spanish called the place, the Aztecs call it Mexico or Mexico. But the Spaniards called it La Nueva España. Well, of course, they were from España, so they spoke with El Fefeo Proprio. La Nueva España. What what is the uh, the dialect that pronounces the X as an S H sound? That would be my homies uh, down in uh, Peru and Ecuador, ah, okay. because they speak what's called Quechua or Quechua, yeah. which is the Incan language. Um, and let's see here. Fuck, I'm man, I just had his name on the tip of my tongue. The Incan Emperor, the last one that they uh, killed. Ah, anyway, that was the Pizarro brothers and the conquering of South America. Um, but anywho, uh, so like for example, the word popcorn, right? In in, in Ecuador, they use the Incan term congil. Congil, but like in Mexico, like in Acapulco, if you say, you know, uh, 
me gustaría una funda de canguil. They're like, you want a bag of what? You want a what? Una funda de canguil, por favor. Tengo el hambre, por favor. Right? Well, in Mexico, it would be called palomitas. In Mexico, they call popcorn palomitas. Ah. You've probably heard of palomitas. That's popcorn. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I only hear about half the words in Spanish. It's terrible. It's a blur. Yeah. But it's at but, least I'm hearing half of them now, as opposed to just... Blah, blah, blah. Have you ever seen the Achotillo fruit that this song is about? It's a red-colored fruit. It's about the size of, like, maybe a lemon, maybe just smaller than it. More like the size of a lime. It's red, but it's, like, spiky all the way around it. Oh, okay, yeah. It's yeah. got, like, yeah. these little red spikes coming all the way around it. And when you actually open it up... Like it almost looks like inside, a little pineapple. It's like a big, white, seedless-looking grape inside. And you go to eat the Achotillo fruit inside the shell. And kind of tastes like a grape. Hmm. A big, just a really, really fucking big Spiky jumbo grape. grape. Yeah. Huh. But it has a pit inside of it. Just like, so it's just like kind of like eating a peach. And so you end up biting the last juicy, sugary bits off of the little hmm. pit seed in the middle of it. That's Acho Tia. So I guess, you know what? Fuck it. Before I smoke more weed and cigarettes, we're, we're going to try to perform a song. All right. In Castellano, the Spanish language. Shout out to all my Hispanophones out there speaking the Spanish. Viva el corresponsal. Y viva Radio Libertad. All right. Let's see here. This is called Acho Tio. Uh, all right. Here we go. Hopefully the microphone will pick it up.
Viva Ecuador. There you go. Hopefully you were able to hear that. Yeah, it was a little muffled, uh, but I could I could still make out most of it. Uh, have you recorded that one? Yeah. Uh, okay. In fact, um, a friend of mine put me up with uh, Spanish rap, rap, rapperette, rappress, una rapera de España. Hmm. And the Ciudad de Seville, um, a, a, a rapper from Seville, Spain. Her name is uh, Calliope. Uh, and Calliope. Yes, ca like Calliope. Wow. Calliope. Um, and, uh, or Calliope. And uh, she added some rap to my song, uh, Acho Tio. Let me see here. In fact, I have a video for that that I made uh, about two weeks ago. Let me see where I uploaded that. I'm, I don't think that I put that on the YouTube. I mean, I have been putting some of the rap hip hop type remix stuff on the new and improved YouTube channel number four. God, Jesus. YouTube. You're up to four Jeez. already. I've, I've gone through three channels already. Wow. Um, and I'm on my second Twitter channel now. And <laughs> that's when you know you're doing it right, man. Like you keep yeah. getting shit fucking deleted. And you're obviously attracting the right attention. You're making the lists that matter, right? Shout out Homeland Security that's and my good. local fusion center in Clarksburg, West Virginia. Yeah. Hey, guys. Um, thanks for thanks to Leona. That, well, I, I'm going to say they have at least four or five translators at the Fusion Center just because of the Yona. That's right. <laughs> Keep translating, fuckers. <laughs> I can't understand what he's saying. <laughs> Acho Tio video. Let's see. Well, there's the Red River remix, but that is not the one with. Calliope. That's funny because I was just looking for, or I was about to go looking for the latest Reese oh. report to see where I might be able to find it. Let's I bet see. it's you... on Bandot Video. All right, we'll go to the U. All right, here's your chance, Lifelog Google. Life Oh, there it is. Exactly what I'm looking for. YouTube. All right. And thanks to my eighth Google Gmail address, I have the YouTube channel number four. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, you know, I, I never thought I would actually become one with this sock puppet, but here we are. Here we are. But it is 2023, you know. You got to try new things and experiment a little bit. Censor me harder, Daddy. Uh, let's see. Videos. <sighs> wow. Kind of slow there. Kind of slow. Mm -hmm. YouTube. Nothing else is slow like this, but YouTube is. There it is. Acho Tio Zangano Remix. It is on the YouTube channel. But we're not going to try to play it from my uh, 25 and a half year old uh, desktop here. I will just send you the link. Where are you going to send it? Uh, DM to the dicksword.com. Uh, drop it. Uh, well, all right. Yeah, that'll work. Discord. I was going to say drop it in the Telegram channel, but if you don't have it on your desktop, it'll it won't work so right yeah well i did have it on the desktop but it was not wanting to work with my um windows xp uh. which is an upgrade from windows 98 but since it's 2023 because turns out i don't know if we can get the let's see if i can throw some light onto at long last 
Let's do it like this. Okay, let there be light. Let's move the camera over here. Uh oh. This is live radio, ladies and gentlemen, um, that you're seeing. Okay, we are not. This is oh, exciting. Yeah, yeah there, there it is. There it is, folks. Believe it or not, that is a brand spanking new fucking computer tower. Oh, wow. That's now fully assembled. I will have to share this clip with Death to Tyrants from uh, the great land of Kanukistan, ruled by Justin Trudeau. Uh, some of you may know it as the land of Canada where, you know, allegedly Indian secret services from New Delhi go to assassinate Sikh leaders that they call terrorists. Uh, oh if God, you didn't know, there's a, there's a big diplomatic row right now, like row <laughs> between Canada and India. And, you know, when um, uh, Canada's first black prime minister, um, Jisden Turthole, went to um, the Indian subcontinent and met with um, uh, Narendra Modi, leader of India, he pressed him about this allegation that Indian spies in Canada had whacked um, Sikh leader dude from Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that apparently everybody's all up in arms about right now. And so Modi at the time was like, bro, you're fucking nuts. So just in turd hole, um, slimed his way back to Ottawa. Um, that's Canada's national capital for those that uh, weren't aware. Again, take notes if necessary. Get fact harder with Colonel Thrizzle and Major High Yona. Um, so when he gets back to Ottawa, Justin Turthole, Canada's first black prime minister, instructs his uh, uh, foreign service to uh, revoke the diplomatic credentials of India's um, ambassador uh, and to evict him from Canada. And so thus began what we like to call a diplomatic tit for tat. Hmm. Because I, I believe some course, might call it a row. Yeah, yeah, it's row, row. And and so it's, India in response <laughs> in uh, New Delhi responded by kicking out one of the Canadian diplomats. Hmm. And then Canada then responded to the India's move kicking out their diplomat by saying, I'm not your buddy, guy. <laughs> India then responded by saying, I'm not your guy, pal. It, it was like a whole Terrence and Philip thing. Back and forth. <laughs> They're still back and forth. I'm not your buddy, guy. And then just farting in each other's general direction. It's <laughs> kind of entertaining, really. <laughs> All right, so how do you want to uh, bring in uh, this video here? So this song, if you speak Spanish and understand Spanish, it would just seem that I'm talking about fruit, right? Mm -hmm. La fruta se arino y por el placatazo, right? The fruit has ruined because of the package. But in fact, if you read between the lines, El Pacatazo actually refers to the International Monetary Fund loan package that was negotiated oh. between Christine Lagarde and newly inaugurated um, Ecuadorian president at the time, Lenin Moreno, who had been vice president to uh, Rafael uh, Correa Delgado, Rafael Correa. And, of course, during the Correa administration, Julian Assange had been granted diplomatic asylum mm -hmm. at Ecuador's embassy uh, property in London, England. Um, and, in fact, before Correa left office, 
Assange had actually been given complete Ecuadorian citizenship and an Ecuadorian passport. And Correa was in negotiations with the British trying to get Assange to Ecuador and out of London. Moreno then came in office with uh, one of the other people from uh, Pais, which was the Partido Alianza, the Ecuadorian political party. I'm, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole with all the different political parties, but basically like a constitutional libertarian type party with Pais, Alianza Pais, or Peace Alliance basically, mm. but it's the PAIS. Anyway, so the political party... Peace or the National Alliance? It was the National Alliance PAIS, which was the Partido yeah. Alianza, basically of the Socialist Party. So it was all the different worker co-ops because Ecuador has like provinces and then cantons, kind of like the way we have mm. precincts and but, but long story short, they were the leftist party, we'll say. Whereas the right party is all like Guillermo Lasso, who's the current president of Ecuador, a banker, a, a former um, J.P. Morgan banker, kind of yeah. like Emmanuel Macron. And Guillermo Lasso is a regular at um, the... Um, confabs that they have there in Davos with our our beloved uh Uber mention led mm-hmm. by uh Herr Klaus Herr uh, Herr Schwab Klaus mm-hmm. yeah Herr Klaus Schwab um but when Correa left and Moreno had been his vice president which Moreno is like FDR actually in a wheelchair Oh, okay. He, he was apparently, he didn't, he's in a wheelchair because he he suffered a a a, a hit a, an armed robbery. Oh, I thought you and were. The robber shot him in the lower part of the back, making him paralyzed from the waist down. Gotcha. I thought you were saying he figured out how to stay in office longer than was actually legal to do. Well, well, he did try to do that, but um. They decided they wanted Lasso in power. Because for those that aren't aware, Ecuador is the only foreign country on planet Earth that is allowed to use the United States dollar as its actual currency in trade every single day. And they're the only country in the world that's allowed to mint pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters, and dollar pieces. With Spanish on them. Interesting. And Ecuadorian people. So they had Ecuadorian coins, but then all the paper money that's used is American. And of course, they also have the American change too. Um, it's really hard to find Ecuadorian dollar coins, but they use American dollar coins like crazy in Ecuador. Like you, mm. you give somebody a $20 bill and buy something for a dollar. They'll give you 19 fucking coins. You're like, holy shit, I got a gang of seconds in my pocket. God man. damn it. 19 fucking oh. they do that shit here too. Yeah. Because like instead of like calling the, the person over to make change, I'll get like, you know, ten or twelve uh five peso coins. Because I'm supposed to get I like 70 pesos back, coin. you know. They yeah. love fucking coins. They used to have a five dollar coin in Ecuador. They'll probably right. bring it back. Well, they just love before, their fucking coins. Before but we get long too story far short, away, yeah. Pompeo signaled the end. This is the end of the story. Moreno gets in office after inaugurate. Less than a week later, there's Mike Pompeo. I'm sorry, Mike Pompeo, um, announcing that with the departure of Correa. U.S. military bases are now once again, welcome back. And now the DEA is going to open up four other forward bases to help fight drug trafficking in Ecuador. 
which had pretty much been wiped out after Correa got rid of the DEA. Hmm. Well, there you go. Uh, Democracy that, in that, action. That happened, and then literally the very next day after Pompeo left, they yeah. announced the IMF package, <laughs> um, which that's in the midst of the Panama Papers coming out, which showed that Moreno got, like, I don't know how many millions of dollars from a Swiss bank account literally a week after he signed into law the Pacatazo, the IMF package, which, of course, comes with strings attached. And mm -hmm. two of those strings were that he had to get rid of the subsidy for gasoline and get rid of the subsidy for kerosene and propane. So oh, get rid of all of these subsidies on um, you know, petroleum products, which was done for the benefit of the working class. And all of a sudden, gas tripled in price and propane quadrupled in price. Which is a big fucking deal because most people in Ecuador actually use propane tanks to power their clothes dryers, to power oh, wow. their uh, refrigerators, to power their uh, range and oven and everything. Um, it's crazy how much they use propane for. I mean, if King of the Hill, if old Hank went down to Mexico... <laughs> or God forbid, anywhere in Latin America to sell propane, he'd be richer than El Chapo. He'd have a fucking gold grill. So would Boomhauser. They'd all be they'd all be millionaires. All right, can we listen to this now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> ¿Cómo están? Repasamos titulares. Máxima tensión en Ecuador. La sede del gobierno se traslada a Guayaquil. El gobierno denunció que los manifestantes intentaron tomar el edificio. El Lin Moreno denuncia un supuesto Zongano plan para revolucionarlo. Orquestado por Nicolás. Zongano es el español para trabajo de trabajo. ¿Puedes escuchar eso? Oh, sí. Está bien. Los 
tremendo, como llamamos en Ecuador, paquetazo al pueblo ecuatoriano, que no se veía hace 14 años esta clase de medidas. Y por eso, es un cúmulo de cosas, pero esta es la gota, y gran gota que derramó el vaso, ha salido masivamente el pueblo ecuatoriano con todo derecho a protestar en las calles. All right. So, uh, so for those that don't speak Spanish, um, there at the end was former president of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, talking about the terms of the um, IMF package, uh, El Paquetazo del Fondo Monetario Internacional, uh, which uh, has a 14-year uh, payback uh, and required the suspension of the rights of all Ecuadorians. Ecuadorians is basically what uh, Correa j just said there mm. at the end. Um, and it's just been really really nasty what happened because you know uh when this war was economic war was basically declared on the working class in ecuador which are known as um la clase obrera right working mm -hmm. class or um la clase de los zangano zangano would be worker drones worker bees uh and so when there was the uh immediate protest in the streets to this basic 180 from everything that Correa had done since 2007. You know, I mean, it was Correa was a rock of steadiness and power for over 10 years. And uh, he basically, Moreno, just completely sold the country out to the globalists. Uh, and, you know, now they've got all that Uh, facial scans everywhere because I mean when I was down there I had to show my passport every time I would shop at one of the major stores and had to uh, it, it's just crazy all the stuff that where they keep track of digital receipts of every single financial transaction and that was under Correa because Correa was an economist and Correa himself was a WEF uh, young leader you know it's not like wow. there's a bunch of good guys out there there's bad guys of Different levels of badness, basically. But Correa was, you know, all things considered, Correa was one of the best leaders of Ecuador. And uh, when he left, because his wife is Belgian, and he went to Belgium to be with his wife and her family, and that's what's kept him from being thrown in jail in Ecuador, because they, no, the Moreno government then put out arrest warrants and actually arrested the vice president, Jorge Gloss, Allegedly for ties to the uh, Odebrecht scandal, which has tied up a bunch of politicians across Latin America. Odebrecht is a big contractor that builds hydroelectric dams. Mm -hmm. uh, and ironically, it's all connected to the IMF because it's the IMF 
Imagine that. It gives the loans to these countries to build these dams uh, for the hydroelectric because then they can sell carbon credits for countries that pollute. They can then trade these carbon credits and do carbon swaps for investing in, you know, uh, I don't know, deforesting more of Mato Grosso Sul and Brazil to build another monster hydro plant. And, you know, of course, they have to clear cut, you know, 3,500 hectares of forest, but whatever. It's, well, it's good it's, for the environment. Yeah, they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna sequester all of, all of those trees in the ground so that the carbon doesn't go up into the atmosphere because that is gonna be really bad for the other life forms that are about to come visit us, Yona. Don't you know that? Yeah, we're terraforming yeah, out- the planet so that it's more habitable to the aliens. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm not saying it was aliens, but yeah, it was aliens. <laughs> it definitely was. I got that on a coffee mug somewhere. But funny story. Um, so this revolution de los Zonganos mm-hmm. was so brutally crushed, and to this day, there's still literally thousands of Ecuadorians that are just missing. They're just disappeared. It's gone. No phone call to the lawyer, no court hearing, no habeas court, you know, no habeas process, you know, habeas corpus, you know, Mm -hmm. no arraignment, no charge. It's disappeared. And that, so that's the whole thing of the song Acho Tio, because I keep talking about Zangano desaparecido, which is talking about basically workers have been disappeared. Um, much like the uh, January 6th insurrection in, 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 that I had mentioned earlier in their guided velvet rope tour, taking selfies with the White House Capitol security personnel there. Turns out there's over a thousand American citizen political prisoners who are doing hard time yep. being sent mess plates with fucking neutral up on it. They're essentially in the group. They went to a stop the steal rally and then they followed Ray Epps over to the Capitol. Into the building. Into the building. And uh, the rest is. Uh, Joe Biden history, you know, and yeah. that that allowed them to make a new green zone in the middle of Washington D.C., which I need to check up oh, on no, this no, no, because no. Well, they were planning on actually subdividing what they're calling before, the, the national district, and that the national district will be separate from the rest of Washington D.C. Even what? Like a Vatican yeah. City type of deal, like a like oh, a fuck a, that, like a walled in bat because everywhere they, it, you know, what a perfect perfect comparison drizzle because literally the 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 borders of this new national district within the District of Columbia is where Biden built the hastily built inauguration wall. Mm -hmm. which is still there with the security checkpoints and all that. Ironically, Joe Biden was able to build more miles of wall (laughs) within the District of Columbia before his so-called, air quotes, please, oh, there they are, inauguration, where the public was not allowed but 32,000 troops were allowed to ensure mm-hmm. that the installation of the regime. I'm sorry. Oops. They had they had a bunch of Did flags. Did I say installation too. of regime? They had Inaugural. a bunch of flags, yeah. It, it, was, it was very a patriotic. Transfer of it was power. beautiful, yeah. It was totally a peaceful transfer of power replete very with 32,000 troops marching down the street. Yeah. Bivouacking in parking garages. Remember when that made the news? Yep. I do. Yeah. And that's how our most popularly elected 
political ticket in American history was, um, I can't say inauguration. Um, ushered. They were installed. ushered into power. They were installed. They were they were ushered into power. Mm-hmm. Let me say, yeah, yeah. Just Shorty because they right had up. ushers at the ceremony does not mean they were ushered in. They were installed. Everybody yeah. knows it. But nobody remembers any of that installation stuff going on. They remember that really cool, quirky picture of Bernie Sanders with the mittens <laughs> on and the scarf and his hands folded in the chair. Wasn't that the coolest fucking meme to totally distract you from the fact that poopy pants and um, endless cackling? Yeah, cackles. Basic, you know, basic poopy and cackles, you know, or we're going to call them the shits and giggles. Shits and giggles, yeah. I was going to say. Shits and giggles were basically put into power with uh, 30,000 National Guard troops. Hmm. 33,000, um, I believe it was. Yeah, yeah, 33,000. Yep. And uh, it's the magic number. And that bastard was able to put up more miles of wall because mm-hmm. there's actually, they built three walls. There's the <laughs> wall that's good the enough. actual they had to build three. perimeter mm-hmm. itself. There's the inner wall. And then more recently, he built a third wall just around the White House itself. Mm hmm. Because he's so popular. Yeah. I mean, obviously the most popular leader of American history. Most votes. And hastily history. put up three sets of fucking walls to keep him between yeah. his loving public and himself. Makes and nothing diapers. but sense. Nothing but and sense. Lots of diapers. Lots yeah. of diapers. Turns out the Secret Service ain't so secret because everybody is on to the whole shitting in the pants thing. And, you know, to be fair to Joe Biden, you know, I haven't seen Joe Biden stroke out on camera as bad as Mitch McConnell. And again, to Joe Biden's credit, he doesn't have that Bieber face like the, the poofy eye like die Fi. You know what I'm saying? Look, it, this gerontocracy we're in up here in America, we're waiting to welcome you back, Drizzle. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, just, just in order to show your appreciation to the land of your birth and the land that you love from coast to coast across the, the verdant purple plains of America, if you can find like some boost or some inshore, maybe a little six pack to bring back across the border. To, to show love and compassion for our beloved gerontocracy because Nana has to drink the boost. That's what the doctor said. You know, it, it helps fight the osteoporosis, the drizzle. Yeah, yeah, sure. Have you seen my video for the Chuck Yeager song? LD noticed in the video. Yeah. Uh, because the video for my song, um, uh, Lincoln Days, Chuck Yeager Meister remix. Um, Chuck Yeager, for those that don't remember, was the West Virginia native who broke the sound barrier, Mm -hmm. piloting the X-1 at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base outside of uh, Dayton, Ohio. Anyways, um, (coughs) in the video I have of the Lincoln County, West Virginia, 4th of July parade, which is the main event every year in that county. And in that music in, in that music video for the song, which has Chuck Yeager in the beginning, in his own words, telling the story of when he actually broke the sound barrier and then cue the Yona with the piano and the singing. And so the very beginning of the parade is led by none other than Uncle Sam himself. Hmm. But Uncle Sam has a really long white beard and he's actually pushing a walker. And so LD says in the comment, he's like, Yona, that is that is spot on with Uncle Sam pushing the walker down the road. Like, here we are, you know, empires yeah. rise. And, and empires fall. fall. 
and in between is the beautiful circling the drain part, which is, um, <laughs> well, that brings us up to date. And here Pretty we much. are. Here Pretty we much. Are. And that was drain. a perfect way to say <laughs> to the next video that we have prepared here, Yona, because <laughs> somebody, I don't know who it was. Let me see. Let me try and pull it up real quick and see if I can find it here so that I can give due credit. Uh, oh, it was uh, El Guapo. Uh, he, he, who held, he who shall not be named in the Liberty Radio Telegram channel donated this one, but it is a brand new, I believe, Reese report. Just came Fuck out yeah. today on InfoWars about what multiple remote viewers have seen regarding uh, something that may occur at year's end. So uh, let's take a listen oh, to yeah. this. <coughs> The counterculture is now aware of false flags, operations that are executed by the powers that be and blamed on someone else are now being called out in real time on social media platforms. Despite all the censorship, it's becoming popular. And if the powers that be can no longer trick us, then they will try and hurt us. According to the scientific data, nearly all humans have a certain degree of psychic awareness, and some of us become acutely aware of it. The term remote viewing was coined by the U.S. Department of Defense when they began training people in this field. It is the art of viewing an unknown target at any distance within the mind's eye and retrieving accurate data. To refine this data, remote viewers work together as a team and look for redundant data. When we look at remote viewing data, if one person says something, you know, that's interesting. If two describe the same thing, that's a little more weight when three or four describe the same thing. We pretty much take that to the bank. Remote viewing teams such as the Future Forecasting Group work with a double blind protocol. This means that they do not know where or what the target is. The information they are given is an arbitrarily designated number, such as A9I5-Q7K4. As they blindly view the target in a meditative state of focus, imagery is flashed in the mind and immediately sketched out and collected. The Future Forecasting Group has been successful at predicting the Panama Canal incident, the destruction of the Kokovka Dam in Ukraine, the Halloween stampede in South Korea, police violence at the Canadian trucker protest, and many others, which can all be found at futureforecastinggroup.com. The Future Forecasting Group was recently assigned the target of the next financial crisis, but the entire team was all distracted by overpowering images of a catastrophic event. They all saw the same thing, massive explosions with multiple points of impact, small particles and debris falling from the sky, people sick with cesium, which is the most dangerous of all radioactive isotopes used in dirty bomb scenarios. They saw police checkpoints, people seeking shelter underground, and an exodus of sad-looking people. Remote viewing goes back in the written record for millennia and has been repeated in the current scientific record for decades. According to this body of work, most people are able to do this. And this is why Cliff High's predictive linguistics program works. By reading the entirety of human language across the World Wide Web, the program will list repeated words and phrases in all languages, creating a macroscopic view of what everyone is talking about. So if all humans are psychic, whether they know it or not, then you would see it in the collective chatter, especially for traumatic events. The bigger the trauma, the more people would be emoting their anxiety online. And key words can be found, such as the word ejecta, which has been showing up in Cliff High's work, which shows the same event. My data had, has very rarely had this particular set of words show up in it, and one of it was ejecta. Ejecta. As though ejecta. And, and that was in our remote viewing data, like, yeah. 
Predictive linguistics reveals a time frame of when a big event happens at the point in time when the tension language ends and the release language begins. The tension language is the psychic awareness before an event, and the release language is the event itself as everyone is made aware. Based on this, Cliff High sees this event happening near the end of the year. Both the Predictive Linguistics and the Future Forecasting Group saw that this was a decision that was made by some faction of government, and they propose that if enough eyes are on the powers that be, that maybe it will never happen. We are in this period of time that I call uncertainty, okay? And mm -hmm. throughout, through, from here to the event is an uncertain period of time in which we will feel uncertainty as we move towards this event. But I'm of the opinion that we can do things now that will alter the potential future that would arise. And so people out there, if we, I'm of the opinion that if we got enough people to talk about this and know about this, it would make uh, both of us into bullshitters because it wouldn't happen. Reporting for InfoWars, this is Greg Reese. Yeah. What a great way to cover your ass. <laughs> but to be fair, I have been on to this story uh, ever since 911 because when September the 11th, 2001 happened, um, uh, you know, well, I don't want to really want to get into the whole pre-story, but prequel story we'll go on to one one other day uh just remember to ask me about my arabic language course book volume one when i began my arabic studies in the united states army in october of 1993 and my oh wow arabic book on the cover had an illustration of the north and south tower of the world trade center being struck by two different airplanes Seriously? And that was a TLD publication marked 4 93, meaning it was printed in April of 1993. It was issued to me in October of 1993. And I never really thought anything of it until September the 11th, 2001, at which point, when the second plane hit and I saw it live on TV on North Spalding in downtown Lebanon, Kentucky, Marion County, I flew home. And went tearing through my boxes of all of my books and BDUs, camo, you know, tops and bottoms, BDU battle dress uniform, your army camos, you know, mm -hmm. all of my everything I was ever issued, right? I'm digging through, oh, I'm, 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 and I'm going through book after book. I'm like fucking Johnny Five the robot, need more data. Oh, I'm just going flipping through books, and I found it. Every fucking hair. I mean, I've. I, I don't know if you can see it. I got the fucking goosebumps now. I mean, it oh, gives wow. me goosebumps yeah. just to think about it. It scares me to death. I found the book. And I pretty much suffered a mental breakdown. I, I went into one of the rooms in the basement and drew this huge wall mural using six different colors of paint. Um, and just all kinds of stuff. And, and my family freaked out. And that's the first time I went to a mental hospital. Um, yeah, Because I, I, I was telling them that this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. You know, pretty soon we're going to get hit with the depleted uranium dirty bombs. And everybody's going to be sick with cesium. And, and, and so just like on the Terminator movie where Sarah Connor is taken to the mental hospital, for telling things that are going to fucking happen that are actually true. Um, and then, of course, she gets out and goes to, well, that would be where Drizzle is right now. Good old Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, shout out, um, Sarah Connor. Have you seen this boy? So anyways, um, turns out I wasn't crazy. I was right. Um, but what I'm alluding to Which is... Which they often look similar. That's right. the strange part. So when I got out of Green Oaks, <laughs> they, uh, they had me in the fucking padded room in the padded suit with the fucking belts and everything for about three days. It was oh, worse shit. than jail. Worse than jail. Oh, I believe it. Thanks, family. And, and people wonder why I don't talk to my brothers or sisters hardly ever. But they all got the vaccine. They're all up to date. So they're good. Um, anyways, um, 
<clears throat> so I get out and I'm like, I've got to look up Jade Hill. Who is doing the exercises at Jade Helm now? And for those that aren't aware, Jade Helm is like a summertime exercise that they normally have at the mock-up American City, which is like it's a fake. It's imagine like a Hollywood set where you have like a real live American City, but it's in um well Fairfax, Quantico. Yeah, I thought it was down near Quantico. Place. Um, yeah, it's a full-scale replica, full replica of an average American city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, Drizzle knows. Drizzle yeah. knows. Um, and I've driven right by Quantico, it. Right by Quantico Creek, um, mm -hmm. off of I-95 and U.S. Route 1 in Northern Virginia there. Uh, yeah, right they run drills the there all the time. Just south. Of, in fact, it's just south of uh, George Washington's Mount Vernon Plantation. Shout mm -hmm. out Slave Teeth Ventures. Um, yeah, and I think so, I even uh, included it when I wrote about Rex 84. Yeah. Yeah. And so they have these Rex 84 COG exercises called Jade Helm every summer at the mock-up city, um, which for those that aren't aware, um, Rex 84 and COG is talking about, well, COG stands for continuity of government. So that's where they have a secret permanent, unelected federal government apparatus mm -hmm. that will continue to rule us if our totally in power meaningless puppet government should fall to the wayside um don't worry I, it's kind of a dumb conspiracy to talk about deep underground military bases like raven rock and others but turns out that's actually a thing and mm -hmm. Some would allege that Dick Cheney is the current emperor of, he's the current American emperor. He's still pulling all the levers, Robo Cheney, down in uh, Raven Rock Mountain Complex. Shout out to the Keystone State in beautiful Pennsylvania. And uh, in fact, we have a, a good friend, of mutual friend of ours, the one I call Ukuwesa, uh, the chief of cats. Uh None other than the one we've all grown and loved, uh, the one we've all grown to love through trivium and logic. Tony Myers, mm -hmm. in fact, lives just a stone's throw from the very center of power of the American government itself. There in the Poconos, RR to the MC, Raven Rock Mountain Complex. So that led me down the wormhole when I got out of Green Oaks. And they're all telling me I'm fucking crazy. I thought, I got to look at what's going on at Quantico because everything is planning for a big event. And that's what that's when I found out about Sea Smurf. If you've never heard of Sea Smurf, well, <clears throat> as I've said three times already, the name of this show, the inaugural edition, is called Get Fact Harder with Colonel Drizzle and Major High Yona. Um, and C Smurf is actually one of those military acronyms. Oh, don't we love our acronyms like FUBAR or YOLO or TLDR. Uh, in this case, it's CCMRF. And there's no better acronym than an acronym which contains acronyms. Because it turns out CCMRF, the C, the first C in CCMRF, stands for CBRNE. So it's actually CBRNE CMRF. That would be chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, or explosive event consequence management resource force. Or as they're now known, the United States Army of the North, which was, they officially took up that name, which had been retired since the Posse Comitatus Act of 1877, which forbid military from practicing law enforcement within the United States. But you'll be happy to know, posse commentators, fuck that shit. It's gone. We now have a standing army within the United States um, called Sea Smurf. Um, and they're primarily based in Fort Stewart, Georgia, which is in Chatham County, Savannah, Georgia, right off uh, the intersection of Interstate 16 and Interstate 95. Fort Stu is, is old growth, like us would call it. Uh, there's also a contingent at Fort Gordy. I'm sorry, Fort Gordon. 
uh, right beside Augusta National, which is where they play the Masters Golf Tournament every year. Uh, also in Georgia, on the Savannah River. Uh, and then, of course, they are the ones that uh, Jade Helm is their main event every year. You know what I'm saying? If you're a White House correspondent, main, main event every year is nerd prom, right? The correspondence dinner, right? right? Where, where the judge gets to, where the, where the president gets to tell drone jokes and everybody laughs. As we talk right. about, you know, um, well, it's where they get to, yeah, killing. they get to talk about all the evil shit that they do and make it seem and then, like it's and just laugh a joke. About it. Yeah, <laughs> we came, we yeah. saw, he died. Ha 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 ha. And so that's their nerd prom, and and then for C Smurf or Army of the North, I, I like C Smurf better because you know, shout out Smurfs and shout out Steve Poikinen and AM Wake Up and Koki Smurf, oh. aka Voldemort Zelensky. That's what um, I thought you were talking about at first. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag shellying <laughs> so uh you know you, you look at where we're at now and it's it's literally just mind-boggling mm. it, it, it's mind-boggling the the point at which we find ourselves now and so when you think about chemical biological radiological nuclear and explosive event mm -hmm. well to me that's like a checklist kind of like that time the story we've heard so many times about General Wesley Clark saying that, oh, we're invading seven countries. Like, like, cause remember the, cause he's like, yeah. Hey, yeah, the we West just Clark had seven. one and I hear we're going to invade Iraq. Mm -hmm. He's like, Oh, it's much worse than that. Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, names off seven countries. And we've been to all seven now. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and so it was like the same thing for me with the CBR and E. Well, we had the anthrax attack. That was the biological. We had the explosive event. That was mm -hmm. not one. Mm -hmm. We've had the coronavirus. That was the chemical attack. Because modified RNA is not the same as messenger RNA. And it turns out that mm -hmm. DOD through DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, funded Dr. Ralph Barrick at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, mm -hmm. working with Xi Zheng Li of the Wuhan Institute of Virology to make these fucking chemical biological weapons. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, under the yeah. auspices no, 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 of that, Dr. That's right. Anthony Fauci at the National right. Institutes of Health. Yeah, because right. it turns out they were um, pathogens of pandemic potential. Mm -hmm. PPP. It was PPP uh, research. 3P. 3P approval. Uh, and, and by the way, but before I forget, a shout out to tonight's sponsor of the show. Um, let's see if we can get that in there. That's called Hill Life. Not really focusing very well there. Can you see? Yeah. Well, so, I mean, it's coming I'll, through good on my side. Uh, I'll read Hill the Fire. label here. It says Hill Fire. Yeah. Medical cannabis, West Virginia owned and grown. Oh, nice. Uh, and this is all right. And this is what it actually is. So let's see if we can read that. No, I don't think it's going to focus on those. Focus, motherfucker. Uh, it's not going to do it. Well, anyways, uh, it says. Product form is flower for vaporization. Product name Tolimon Indica. Hmm. I told that motherfucker I wanted sativa. Well, anyways, this has got wow, man. I've been, it's, it's just a bunch of numbers on here. This was packaged on August the 17th, 2023. That was a month ago. So it's a month old, and this came from 329 Jack Burlingame Road, Millwood, West Virginia, hmm. 25262, the Mountain State, Montani Semperly Berry. That's Mountaineers are always free. To find out more, fuck around. <laughs> That's still my favorite soundbite. 
<laughs> I like playing that one. You know, we've even got Rich on the main show talking about it's time to get backed up. Oh, again. yeah. Well, it's, you know, you know it's a part of the intro to every recording yeah. for the most part. So, Busting all right, here's, here's my, because I don't want to get... I don't want to get too far away from this report from the remote viewers, right? Because I yeah. have been listening to and following the predictions of the remote viewers, the, the various of them, and I'm sure, you know, folks who are already familiar with the subject know who the usual suspects are, right? You got Ingo Swan, you got Major Ed Dames, yada, 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 right? Mm-hmm been listening to these guys for more than 20 years now uh sometimes they get things right uh it's it's sometimes spooky how they get things right right but they also get a lot of their predictions wrong and i have heard these remote viewing experts go on and defend their bad predictions by saying, well, it didn't happen the way we predicted because enough people knew about it and affected it. So kind of the, the same kind of thing that they were trying to do at the end of the video there. What a great caveat. I mean, it's the perfect, it's the perfect way to couch prediction, isn't it? We, we see this, it's out there, it's floating in the zeitgeist, which you can't see because you're not a trained expert, right? You're not one of the anointed class. We are here delivering the message to you because we have the power to do it. We're the special people. It's what we call in our business a non sequitur. Yeah. Non sequitur. All of this that I'm telling you that could happen in the future, not sure exactly when, because it's kind of indefinite. Right. And it may never happen if enough people find out about this. And that's so, the other thing, too. The like, that's the other major point is the other thing that I have heard these remote viewing experts say time and time and time again is trying to predict when something is going to happen is nearly impossible. But yet they're they're sure that it's going to be somewhere around the end of the year. Right. Now, here's the thing about it. You know, back when uh, the Yona was active duty in the Army, and that was during Operation Desert Storm. Um, you know, that that's uh, just on the heels of a Department of Defense collaboration with the Department of Energy, because uh, for those that aren't aware, um, part of the Manhattan Project, which made nuclear bombs, uh, was uh, sold to the public as atoms for peace. Mm. And so thus was born the Department of Energy, which its main task its main purpose, the whole reason why the Department of Energy was formed primarily was to dispose of nuclear waste. That's their number one job. And to this day, they still don't have a federal repository for all nuclear materials open. They've tried with Yucca Mountain. They take some things into Los Alamos and New Mexico, but moving on. So, Meanwhile, the U.S. has all of these nuclear power plants that are making atoms for peace. Well, it turns out to make nuclear bombs, you need plutonium. There's nowhere to mine plutonium. The only way to obtain plutonium is to scrape it from the bottom of a nuclear reactor. And so when they say that peaceful nuclear power plants have nothing to do with nuclear bombs that's just a fucking lie Mm. you need the nuclear reactors to transform enriched uranium into plutonium no plutonium no big boom boom bomb bomb 
you got to have the plutonium. So you got to have the power plants making the nuclear reactions to make the plutonium. So how do these nuclear power plants produce electricity? Well, they use the heat from the nuclear reaction to heat water so hot that it boils. And then the boiling vapor, radioactive Steam. vapor, is then aimed against blades like a like think of like a big water wheel at a mill mm -hmm. and it pushes the wheel around an axle and it spins it fast enough kind of like a steam engine mm -hmm. in the old western days or except it's radioactive steam and it's producing toxic cesium radioactive waste that will take sixteen thousand years to fully break down but it's full of loving becquerels for you mom and the kids um and so Quite frankly, boiling water nuclear reactors, arguably the dumbest fucking idea any human being ever came up with. What's the dumbest, stupidest fucking way to boil water and make nuclear waste that we have nowhere to, st we, there's nowhere to put it? So 50 years later, all of a sudden, mm -hmm. you've got all these nuclear power plants with dry cask storage everywhere with spent fuel pools with spent uranium fuel rods and i mean they're just literally virtually every single operating and um decommissioned nuclear power plant in the united states has literally got nuclear waste piled up all over their properties because there's no where to put it finally the doe and what was it 1984 Again with the year nineteen. Seriously, did everything fuckball have to happen in the year nineteen eighty four? George Orwell, Rex eighty four, the the vaccine law in eighty four. Nineteen eighty four is when they roll out depleted uranium, the euphemism for toxic nuclear waste. And then from that point, so when I, I was active duty in ninety three and ninety four, and at that point. We were getting to test out all these brand new products made from depleted uranium, which is, again, a euphemism for toxic fucking nuclear waste right. full of cesium. And so when we had, you know, dud, you know, um, like, like the first depleted uranium helmet combo mixed with the composite resin and Kevlar and shit. And, and they, they would get so hot and then when it would like cool down at night because it would be like 120 during the day and then like 40 degrees at night and they would just crack. So you're just throwing all these fucking depleted uranium cracked fucking helmets in a burn pit along with fucking depleted uranium armor in the fucking vests that were cracking because it's like pieces of ceramic, right? Made of toxic nuclear fucking waste. So you throw it in the burn pit, then they burn the fucking shit in the pit, and then all these soldiers are breathing in cesium, and then they come back home from Desert Storm with um, Gulf's War Syndrome or Crohn's disease, and it, it's exposure to cesium. It's the same reason why all those babies at the Fallujah Maternity Ward come out looking like purple eggplants. And they have the highest incident of anywhere on planet Earth in congenital birth defects, more than 50%. Uh, and again, it's, you know, they, they're finding cesium in the umbilical blood, you know. And so um, I'm just waiting for the United States to bomb itself again with right. dirty bomb depleted uranium and blame it on. Chasa, take your pick. China, Rhina. I'm what? sorry, Russia, China. Iran. See, I'm getting up already. I don't know. They've they've had a hard on for Iran for a long, long time. Long Ooh. time. In terms of geo strategy, I see what you're doing there, Uncle Sam. Because we've got those oil routes. We've got that Belt and Road Initiative. I mean, the choke point for the Silk Road getting to Istanbul 
is right through Has uh, Hasake, which is uh, by uh, Adar Azur and Al Tanaf. Which uh, for the, uh, I'm talking about the border crossings uh, between Eastern Syria and uh, Iraq, and so from the north all the way to the south, you know, um, you've got these three major crossings. Um, Al Tanaf there where Jordan and Iraq meet and then going on up through Deir Azur and up to Hasake all the way up to the Kurdish region and that's the area of northern northeastern Syria that the United States military is still illegally occupying and helping themselves to the oil um, that's the only thing that I miss about Donald Trump as clown fake president guy was the fact that he said so many ugly, nasty things out loud that most politicians say quietly, like, well, we invaded Syria and we're going to take the fucking oil. Because fuck Bashar al-Assad. Our oil now, bitch. And, you know, and it was funny because it was nothing but Trump hate. Nothing but Trump hate until Trump ordered a missile strike mm -hmm. on Damascus for the alleged... Um, a sarin attack near Aleppo. And, and we know it was sarin because there was a CNN reporter chick on the ground who sniffed one of the sarin backpacks and was like, yeah, yeah, you can tell. I, I can smell the sarin on this backpack. I, I don't know if you remember that, that, that I don't, CNN. Seriously. I, don't, I wasn't paying that, attention. That, that actually happened on live TV. Wow. Actually. Um, and so, just nothing but bashing of the orange man until he launched that missile strike against Syria. And then, oh, yeah. and then he was acting that was very when, um, presidential. I was it that. Brian Williams yeah. who said, I know Leonard Cohen just died, but with all due respect to Leonard Cohen, um, I'm, uh, I'm in awe of the beauty. I'm amazed by the beauty of our weapons. Referring to that line from Leonard Cohen, amazed by the beauty. Mm-hmm. That he said, I'm amazed by the beauty of our weapons. And tonight, Donald Trump became presidential. That, that's the two lines that I remember from Brian Williams' mouth there. Uh, I remember him lying about... Um, oh, oh, the, the helicopter ride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I remember him lying yes. about that. And I also remember when him getting caught lying about it yeah those were good times busted busted caught red-handed oh that was good but you know um iran is literally the cradle of civilization in many ways um you know uh and more particularly Iran is already connected to Russia and China and Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, and it is so integrated with standard gauge rail, uh, with oil pipelines and everything else. The United States is just completely overextended. We, we already mm -hmm. have a massive military presence on the other side of Iran there, uh, which, which you got Armenia, and then we're set up shop there in Georgia, in Tbilisi, uh, as well as we have a contingent in Azerbaijan, as mm -hmm. we're supporting the oil dictatorship in Baku, which is still fighting the Armenians over the disputed region known as the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, which is about 200 miles west of the Caspian Sea and the capital city of Baku. Yeah, and that it's, just heated up again within the last 48 hours. Uh, that's right. Yeah, I, that's why I brought it up. And 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 that's why this is not this is called Get Fact Harder with Colonel Drizzle and Major Hyona. Cuz uh even though we 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 yak at yak and we talk back, we also provide fact. There you go. <laughs> So, all right, so the the Ottomans, the Persians, the Russians, and the Chinese are all playing uh, together with one another. 
And uh, British East Sydney Company isn't too happy about I'm sorry. I mean, Kissinger Associates isn't too happy about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say that... Uh... It would be, it would make sense for Israel to go fuck with Iran directly. Because I mean, you know, it's been constant provocations by Israel and the United States against Iran, just one after another. I mean, most notably, because um, I mean, you've got the Stuxnet and the Israeli uh, targeting of the centrifuges and, and other things. But to me, the thing that takes the cake thus far would be where the Americans, the American military in particular, convinced uh, the head of the uh, Revolutionary Guard in Iran, General uh, Suleiman, to come to Baghdad to broker a peace between Yemen and Saudi Arabia uh, and the Al-Emirata uh, uh, United Arab Emirates, sorry, um, translating from the Arabic there. So uh, the, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen in a peace treaty. And back. So, so come on over here with your sexy Shia ways and help us get this peace treaty signed, says Uncle Sam. So General Suleiman arrives at the Baghdad International Airport. And at the Baghdad International Airport, the U.S. just fucking drone strikes him right there and fucking kills him in his entourage. That was under um, President Cheeto, did, a.k.a. Trump, when yeah. they killed General Suleiman. That. Um. Which I remember is that. I thought we were going to go about to as dirty as you could possibly be to lure the guy in at the invite of the U.S. government to broker a peace treaty. He signed the peace treaty, and then they killed him right there at the airport, broad fucking yeah. daylight. I mean, yeah, it's ICBM as brazen right an act ass. of war against Iran as I don't know taking divers from Escambia County, Florida, shout out Pensacola Naval Air Station, and taking civilian divers from Pensacola, Florida, out to, I don't know, maybe about 60 miles east of Copenhagen, Denmark, in the middle of the fucking North Sea, so they can blow up the fucking nerd stream pipes. Hmm. Yeah. That, that, there, there was that, and that's kind of like a direct military attack against russia but maybe the u.s well what about the, the and Crimean the u.s javelin missiles and the you know what actually u.s soldiers firing u.s weapons in ukraine against russians in the field mm -hmm. that's kind of like an act of war too sort of i mean it always has been in the past kind of I would say it's a proxy war in Ukraine, but we've got our own boots on the ground out there. Shout out Lviv. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we've been training fucking Ukrainians since actually, well, um, Fort Campbell, home of the 101st Airborne Division in um, Clarksville, Tennessee, Hawkinsville, Kentucky. It straddles the state line. Shout out puke and buzzards. Um, the 101 has been training uh is it right sector? No, it's not right sector. Is it Svoboda? No, it's not Svoboda. Oh, man. And I'm always telling those jokes about it, too. And I always laugh my ass off. Ass off, battalion. That's it. Right. So they've been training with the 101st Airborne since... 2009 and i'm like well wow george w bush was president from 2001 to 2008 2009, oh technically so obama biden mm -hmm. that's obama biden and wow yeah. so literally 
We first started training fucking Nazis in Ukraine when Joe Biden got in the White House. Oh, my God. Well, I mean, technically, wow. like, if you want to get, like, for real wow. reals about it. Uh, well, we there's started, Gladio. We, Gladio. We, we started training Nazis in Ukraine uh, back in the 1940s. Yeah. Uh, because the whole uh, the whole uh, Banderite uh, thing that was going on in Ukraine back then was being directed by the OSS, which then later became the CIA. the CIA. And just because they changed their name doesn't mean that they relinquished their previous assets, right? Because they had their Ukrainian National Party led by Stepan Bandera. Mm-hmm. And, and that's just been an ongoing project with you know, basically op- like Operation Gladio in some respects is kind of like the European version of Operation Paperclip where they're aiding, abetting and protecting and financing Nazis yeah. in situ in Europe rather right. than paperclipping them, them and out. bringing them over to yeah, the yeah, United yeah. States proper. Yeah. Um, we'll just set them up where they are so that they can take advantage of the resources that are available in situ. But, you know, in terms of official military cooperation and military training, it begins in 2009 with the 101st Airborne Division being deployed to Lviv, Ukraine, which is on the very westernmost edge of Ukraine where it borders uh, up with uh, Poland, um, which is, you know, that's the part of the country where kids teach their, where parents teach their kids the cute little Hitler youth songs and stuff. It's oh, really nice. cute. Really cute. Wir marschieren für Hitler. It's, it's, it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird. Kind of weird. And for those that, that you know, their heart goes out to that beautiful blue and yellow flag, and they want to do something to help those poor Ukrainians. Uh, I, uh huh. And what else, Sasha? And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm I'm on the phone with my buddy Sasha from Mariupol, and he's telling me that they need more boxes of Saran wrap and duct tape. Please send more. And if you're in England, that's clean wrap, clean wrap, um, clean wrap. Clean wrappings and um, scotch tape in England. And we would say duct tape and saran wrap. But please, send as much as you can because not everyone volunteers willingly. So they have to be saran wrapped <laughs> to utility poles until they can muster the patriotism in their heart to earn that Nazi tramp stamp that's carved into their back with a buck knife. Anyways, okay. Yeah, <laughs> Thank there... you very much, Sasha. Weren't there a few nations that were actually extraditing uh, Ukrainian men back to Ukraine because they had fled the country prior to, I guess, the draft or whatever being instituted? And now they're like, no, you have to go back and die for your country now. I I know that you thought you would be be safe in Chisinau, but the Moldovans said, fuck you get your ass back across the border or go hide with the Russian military in that little Transnistria strip there, mm. Bucker, in Tiraspol. Um, which, uh, you know, there's, at this point, there's basically four new um, city-states that have, or, or provinces, if you'd rather use that term, that have basically been added to the Russian Federation um, in addition to the Crimea. Right. So you've got the Crimean Peninsula with, with you know, Simferopol and Sebastopol and all that good stuff. Uh, you know, it's basically the equivalent of Norfolk, Virginia for the Russian Navy. It's their biggest fucking port right after St. Petersburg and Vladivostok. Um, so it's their southern fleet. Uh, but the four uh, regions that have been added are... Uh, uh, Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson. And, and that's basically all of the parts of Ukraine that borders the Black Sea and the Azov Sea. 
which is because you got the Crimea that comes out and the Crimea is kind of shaped like a pair of truck nuts. And one side of the Crimean truck nuts is almost touching Russia, but then there's like a big body of water over on the eastern side there with all these inlets and stuff going up toward Mariupol and stuff. And that is the Sea of Azov. That's where the Azov Battalion take their name from the Azov River and the Azov Sea there. Uh, and the Azov Sea discharges into the Black Sea underneath the new bridge that Russia hastily built after annexing the Crimean Peninsula. And that would be uh, the Most Krimsky or the Crimean Bridge. Um, uh, That's which one that they was tried to attacked. blow up, right? Yeah. They, they did attack that with yeah. some firebombs. And yeah, they, they tried to blow it up on from fire under. and disabled uh, one side of the four lane decking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um, actually been but, attacked twice now. And, but the Russians had uh, road traffic resumed within two hours and they had the, the bridge completely repaired within two weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it was attacked again. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to the geopolitical games going on now, uh, I'm also seeing a big ramp up in antagonizations uh, with the U.S. Navy, uh, you know, the third fleet in the Pacific there, uh, buddying up with uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., yeah. Um, which everyone remembers his mother, Amelda Marcos, and her mm-hmm. awesome shoe collection in Manila there. Um, and uh, again, this is Get Fact Harder mm-hmm. with Colonel Drizzle and Major High Yona. Uh, can take notes if necessary. It turns out the Philippines and archipelago in the Pacific there uh, between Japan and China and Indonesia um, used to be United States territory. Uh, because it turns out we have to think, still is. you know, for those that don't remember the Spanish American War, yeah, whatever, um, <laughs> uh, 1898 to 1902, I think. But that's how the United States came to possess Guantanamo Bay. Talk meat sandwich, anyone? Um, and that's how we came to possess. Puerto Rico and Guam and Samoa or Samoa or and the Philippines. And ironically, thanks to the racism of America, Americans demanded that they did not want the Philippines to be part of the United States. They did not want Filipinos immigrating to the United States in great numbers because they weren't white enough. Right, they're too brown. Literally, in 1948, they said, you're free. You're free. You're not American anymore. But we're keeping our base at Mount Subic. They're on Mount, at at Subic Bay, next to Mount Penitembo. And in response, God said, fuck you and leave, and Mount Penitembo erupted and covered Subic Bay in all types of pyroclastic flow. And that kind of fucked up the whole Navy presence in the Philippines for quite some time. And then just as soon as we were getting back in their good graces, this really cool gangster motherfucker named Rodrigo Duterte became president. Mm -hmm. And he used to brag about riding around on his little Vespa scooter and just killing drug dealers right off the hip. Bang, bang! Like Yosemite Sam. Rootin' tootin' President Rodrigo Duterte. And he was he, a character. He pretty much told Obama and Biden both to go fuck themselves every yeah. single day he was in office. Yeah, which is why Marcos <laughs> Jr. is now in charge. And now that we've got Amelda Marcos's darling son, Jr. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of... Get some so, new uh, naval bases in there so we can, you know bully our way back into the South China Sea. Yeah. So it was uh, Imelda and what was her husband's name? Ferdinand. Ferdinand. That's right. Imelda and Ferdinand were installed uh, again. There's that word installed by the United States 
uh, at the, the seat of power in the Philippines and their advisor, some people would call him a handler. Uh-huh. Uh, I would probably go that far was none other than the man with the most fantastic tan of all time. You know him, you love him, Yona. George Hamilton. That's right. Yeah. He was the Marcus's handler. George Hamilton has got that kind of tan. It's very rare to find in a white man. Maybe L. Paul Bremer is close. And Mm -hmm. Eric Prince. But George Hamilton take, and I, I would say, well, we'll move up Eric Prince to silver just because of his ties with that uh, Blackwater and and you know his sister Betsy who married into the DeVos family. There, mm-hmm. gotta love those princes of Michigan. But so so we're gonna put George Hamilton at gold with the gold tan, uh, Eric Prince at silver, and L. Paul Bremer with the bronze shout out Iraq is a business opportunity. <laughs> Speaking of green zones. <laughs> we have so many receipts, so many receipts. I know. I think, you know, I actually made a song called incubator babies that I never finished. <laughs> and I think I'm going to go back to that when we get done tonight, because it's got, <clears throat> Well, it's it's actually called um, Incubator Babies, Cold Hard Knowlton Hughes Remix. Because nice. for those that aren't aware, um, the, when the Desert Storm happened and the one I got deployed to, um, it began with the <laughs> with the Kuwaiti ambassador's daughter <laughs> giving her teary eyed drafted text of a speech about the the Iraqi Republican Army came in the maternity ward and they took the babies from the incubators and they put them on the cold hard floor. Is that right, Daddy? And he's sitting right behind her and Nolan Hughes from uh, Reston, Virginia is just directing the whole surprise, fucking, surprise. I'm sorry, Sterling. 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 Uh, I, uh, yeah, well no, actually, no, he is in Reston. But any, anyway, Northern Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> Dull is told away. <laughs> Shout out. What a Alton fucking County. bureaucracy. What a <laughs> shit show. Oh, yeah. my God. It is. Get you some of that Lynchburg lemonade. God damn. <laughs> Shout out Virginia Route 7. Woo-hoo. Oh yeah, I've gotten so fucking high on that road. God, damn. that's the road to Harper's Ferry. Shout out, yeah. Beanie Boy, Tim Pool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. oh wow! I had uh, yesterday on Twitter. <laughs> I had somebody reach out to me and ask why they were showing Tim Pool on the uh, on the mothership broadcast. They're like, D- don't they know that like he's controlled opposition he's like totally bought and paid for it and of course you know i had to be diplomatic in my answer uh but i did uh i did say well yeah yeah we know but the thing about it is unfortunately occasional viewers when they step into the realm of grand theft worldage don't see it for what it is and that is it's a forensic historical time capsule Mm -hmm. in real time and so the content the speakers the those that have the light shown on them in that week's uh episode are there to be preserved Mm -hmm. in the time capsule not as being endorsed by Grand Theft World. It's it, it's not that Grand Theft World is platforming bald spot under um, toboggan Tim Pool. It's that it's critical in the, in, in the time of event, you know, to keep things chronological in the chain of events as things are happening. 
to get what some of these mouthpieces mm -hmm. are mouthing, even though we know that you know, it may be scripted. It may be as real as MTV's real world. But again, it is to capture these things and put them into the time capsule so that we can go back then and reference mm -hmm. when we get further on down the road and see how all these different pieces fit together, just like uh, Richard Grove mind map type stuff mm -hmm. of how things are connected to one another and and eventually when you make all the connections then to me it, it it's no longer intimidating or it doesn't scare me because you know, knowledge is power you know and so don't be scared be prepared you know um you know don't don't get fact out Get backed up with us and get back Carter on occasion. On occasion. Uh, because honestly, I, I think our approach journalistically across the whole grand theft sphere, but I know particularly here with our brand and labor Liberty radio, we respect the intelligence of the audience. And so we continue to carry on adult conversations in an age and media landscape of ever increasing infantilization mm -hmm. and gaslighting, particularly in the independent media now. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, for the occasional viewer of Yona, they're just going to think I'm just some dumbass fucking stoner, which is great. It's, all part of my plan. But for those that are regular viewers and followers, Grizzle and the Yona and everyone else uh, in our Grand Theft World community, you'll know that, uh, uh, in fact, I am a stoner, but, but I actually know some things, too. Um, <laughs> and so I definitely see that the turning of the the, the other shoe to drop will be what I think is a false flag depleted uranium ordnance detonation. Uh, that's my prediction. So if I had to predict the day, I would say 11, 12, 23. Okay. So why, why that event and also why that date? Uh, well, for one, th these guys are really kooky numerologists and 11, 12, 23, 11 plus 12 is 23, 11, 12, 23. And there's something about the number 23 when it comes to numerologists as well. As for the depleted uranium, we literally have depleted uranium falling out of our ass. It's falling out of every hole at every single fucking facility we have. Worldwide, I mean, it's just they can't get rid of enough depleted uranium. This shit's fucking everywhere because they keep running the reactors. They keep making more plutonium so they can keep making more nuky bombs. And then you just keep piling up and stockpiling and stockpiling all this fucking waste. Like, for example, at uh, the Fukushima Daiichi power plant operated by TEPCO, that would be the uh, Tokyo Electric Power Company, right? Um, of course, uh, with the Tohoku, Tohoku earthquake, what was it, uh, March 11th, 2011, 311, 11? Yeah. I like that. Uh, the, the big, and, and that led to all the tsunamis and stuff. This big earthquake off the coast of uh, Honshu, which is the mainland, the main island of Japan. Um, and primarily up along the northern coast near Miyagi. Shout out Mr. Miyagi, wax on, wax off. And so we get these big monster tsunamis, with, you know, cresting 25 meters. So in some places, it actually rose the sea level by 75 feet, going inland for you know, miles. Um, there was one bay that I think was almost six miles deep uh, and then going up the river and it still was 50 feet above sea level all the way some I don't, wow. almost eight miles deep. I just... 
stack. I mean, you've seen the pictures. I'm sure you've seen some of the video footage of the Japanese tsunami. And so, mm -hmm. um, well, they built a Fukushima Daiichi plant on top of a tectonic fault and right on the beach itself, just like the San Onofre power plant near the Mexican U S border on the Pacific coast there by Camp Pendleton at San Onofre, um, uh, which has been decommissioned now. But, uh, when the, it turns out they had four, four reactors had full core meltdown. There were four reactors that melted down, but they had eight reactors and the other four are back up and running and making electricity. Yay. Um, but in the midst of the four meltdowns and all of the radiation and the cracked basement, and, and they just keep pouring water on it to put these fires out, and they ended up with all of this radioactive water with radioactive tritium in it. And so they started piling the shit up everywhere. They finally ran out of room. Literally had nowhere else to put it, so they decided, let's see, today is the 21st of September... So it was about a week and a half oh, ago. It's already the 21st. Fuck. It was about a week and a half ago. TEPCO announced, um, we ran out of room, so we're just going to dump all this stuff back into the ocean now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember when they announced that. And immediately... It was more than a week ago. It was like a about, month ago. Almost a month ago. But yeah. three and a half weeks ago. Three and a half weeks ago. I'm sorry. It was right at the end of August. It was August the 28th, I think, when TEPCO made the announcement. Because then immediately South Korea, the Philippines, China, Vietnam. Well, everybody was China. like, what are you going like, to do what? We don't, want any, we don't want any seafood products from Japan at all. Yeah. But we're still accepting any products from Japan and the United States. Oh, fuck yeah. Americans will eat anything, man. They don't care. Uh, what was it Carlin said? They'll they'll uh they'll even try was it fricasseed raccoons assholes on a stick? They'll try it. I might not have gotten that a hundred percent correct, but it's close. <laughs> but that's funny because uh I've cooked raccoon a number of times and I've actually eaten <laughs> raccoon's asshole on a stick. However, it was not fricasseed. It was not fricasseed. Yeah, you got to try that. It's it's it a special barbecue. southern recipe. Barbecue. I, I I cooked that raccoon in a place called Black Nat, Kentucky, on the Greene County line, about eight miles east of a place called Dumas Walkers, where you can get a slaw burger and a bottle of oh, steam. Yeah, yeah. And that has been made famous by the band that's from Edmonton, Kentucky, down there called the Kentucky Headhunters. Mm-hmm. I want to do Miss Walker's. Get your slaw burger and a bottle of ski. Greensburg, Kentucky. Yeah. Nice. And, and that's where the Yona ate raccoon's asshole on a stick. Wow. That's right. And on that note, Greensburg. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is the. Perfect. This is good stuff, man. This is good yeah, stuff. Sure. I'm telling you. <laughs> right off, right off the fly. Good stuff, man. Yeah. Hey, you made it work. That's the best part. And we're we're in excess of two hours, so that's even better. And uh, and think. so remember tonight's uh acronym of the night was C B R N E. That's chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, explosive events. C B R N E. You could type it in your Google search um, if you want to make better lists. <laughs> I wouldn't. Use a Koja or ask Jeeves. <laughs> Jeeves. Oh, my God. I haven't heard Jeeves in forever. No, but that's that's it. We got to go because it's it's already so the, the plan is we're going to do something are. Friday night. After Drizzle gets done with his Friday night call-in mm -hmm. show, um oh that's right around and about midnight friday night we're going to try the inaugural version of high yona fried days which is just going to be a special type uh series 
for whenever Weeds Days gets postponed to Fridays. Now, there will be other Peasants podcasts and Grand Theft World forums and stuff like that with guests and everything. Um, and that's coming up in October. And apparently, the last thing to share with you good folks, when the drizzle is uh, transiting into the United States there, the first week of October, after your uh, let's see, after you got I quit that, kicking the mic, you got that interview on Tuesday, October the third. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you've got the show, the normal show dates coming up on the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. And no, no, so, no, I'm not going to be doing shows that week. I'm just going to do right. the interview. Uh, but I was going to say for that off week. Uh, we can coordinate and I can try to get uh, material together because at that point I'm going to be using my new and improved kick-ass fucking mm. Canadian computer um, and I'll have the bandwidth and the computing and processing power and the memory at last uh, to actually take on something like that and try to keep your broadcast schedule going um, where you, you know you're not, not going to be able to sit schedule. there and show first up and i so so we'll uh I, i'm just volunteering my time and efforts to to try to keep this the show schedule going because i know when i stop doing the peasants podcast on the regular friday night thing um whenever i do come back and do it i don't get much uh viewership uh mm -hmm during the live stream, but people are coming back to rumble and odyssey and then saying, Oh shit, there's more Yona. I wonder what the Good. crazy shit's on here this time. Yeah. Um, and weeds days has set a very high bar on <laughs> In how far ways than up one. can you possibly be and yet still broadcast? Yeah. Yeah. It, it might be an impossibly high bar. I don't know if anyone else is ever going to be able to reach that. But uh, we're definitely not going to try here tonight. So. <laughs> but that's all I got for you, buddy. That's all I got.